Hello and welcome to Nature Knowledge. This is a speaker series with experts sharing scientific knowledge on current issues affecting nature in Florida. I'm your host, Dr. Shelley Johnson, State Specialized Agent in Natural Resources with University of Florida IFAS Extension. Thanks for joining us today. And I am very excited to introduce this speaker today. Uh, Megan Ellis is a private lands biologist with the Landowner Assistance Program with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. And she was actually a student that worked with me when she was at the University of Florida. And um, I haven't had a chance to collaborate with her since she's graduated and moved on. So I'm really happy to be able to host her today for this program. And she's going to be talking with us about Florida's forgotten habitat and focusing on native ground cover. Okay, Megan, are you there? Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction, Shelly. I am so happy to be here today. And um, as Shelly said, I did work with her uh, when I was in school. So it's very, um, it's an exciting moment for me to be able to come back and help again. So um, uh, like she said, I am a private lands uh, biologist and the Landowner Assistance Program is a branch of FWC that helps private landowners manage for wildlife habitat on their property. Um, if you're interested in uh, wildlife habitat management or just building wildlife habitat in your property, you're welcome to reach out to us. We'll talk more about that later though. Um, I'm gonna turn my camera off for the presentation, but I just wanted to say hello first and um, we'll go ahead and jump in and get started. To start off, we're gonna take a trip back in time. Looking at this map from 1720, you can see the highlighted areas noted savannah and good pasture ground. Historically, the Southeast had large expanses of treeless or nearly treeless habitat that wildlife depended on. We generally refer to these ecosystems as pine savannas now because they consisted of a grassy herbaceous understory with scattered pine trees. It was said that a caravan could travel across these savanna lands virtually unimpeded until reaching a river or cane break. These pine savannas were influenced by disturbances such as fire, windstorms, and flooding. We call the study of the effects of these on these ecosystems disturbance ecology. One of the main disturbances that maintained pine savanna was fire. Fire has been influencing ecological communities for 500 million years since the Silurian. And we know this from historical accounts, tree ring burn scar studies, pollen, and charcoal deposits in soils. Native Americans used fire to maintain hunting grounds, farming areas, and wildlife habitat. Lightning ignited fires burned across the land frequently, stopping at natural fire barriers such as rivers, wet prairies, or swamps. Fire shaped ecosystems across the southeast, and many ground cover and tree species became dependent on it to survive long term. On this slide, you can see just a few effects of fire on these ecosystems. Um, one of the reasons we use prescribed fire today for wildfire mitigation is because it lowers the amount of fuel buildup in a forest and that lowers fire intensity. It reduces competition from oaks and shrubs and stimulates native grasses in the process. It increases the amount and palatability of native forage, which is really great for your deer who love eating that stuff. It consumes forest litter while recycling nutrients to the soil and it builds vegetative structure um, diversity. So we're gonna talk about that more later, um, but just kind of keep it in your head that there's some differences in plant structure. Um, in general, frequent fires reduce leaf litter and prevent hardwood and shrub growth into the midstory, allowing ample sunlight to reach the forest floor and stimulating many herbaceous plants to reproduce. Fire is essential for the regeneration and maintenance of native grasses, herbs, and low shrubs that characterize these communities. But it was also essential in maintaining longleaf pine as one of the dominant tree species that existed across these savanna ecosystems. If you look at the map on the left, you'll see that that green area is in some of the same areas that the map from 1720 had listed um, savanna and good pasture ground, that kind of thing. 
Longleaf pines historically stretch from North Carolina to Texas, covering approximately 60 to 90 million acres. That's over 140,000 square miles of the southeastern United States. These trees grow as tall as 120 feet, up to three feet in diameter, and live more than 500 years. After the Civil War, longleaf pine provided the South with a vital commodity for naval stores and turpentine. By 1994, only about 2.6 million acres remained, and only 0.01% of those remaining acres are considered old growth, which are stands that have not been harvested or disturbed. Longleaf pines and the diverse ground cover they towered over were lost to overlogging, conversion to agricultural crops, and fire suppression. Today, we have approximately 4.7 million acres of longleaf pine due to extensive conservation, reforestation, and restoration projects that began in the 1980s. Many private and public landowners across the Southeast are working to restore historic longleaf pine ecosystems to enhance the aesthetic, recreational, and wildlife values of their properties. But what did these pine savannas look like? It's really hard to picture them nowadays. William Bartram described them as expansive, airy pine forests, the grass covered, or excuse me, the earth covered with grasses, interspersed with an infinite variety of herbaceous plants and embellished with extensive savannas, always green. And that picture there on the right gives you a little bit of an idea. So these were open, sunny, park-like habitats that were among the most biologically diverse on Earth. Remember that question from the beginning? <laughs> With more than 50 species per square meter, some old growth pine savannas still rival the biodiversity of rainforests at that scale. More than 900 plant species are found in these landscapes and nowhere else. It is this diverse ground cover that our native wildlife depend on for food, shelter, and water. There are many characteristics of the native ground cover in these ecosystems that suggest these are long-lived, slow-growing species. Some of these include extensive root systems and the ability to re-sprout or fruit following fire. As an example, there are actually saw palmettos in Kissimmee Prairie that have been aged at over 1,000 years old. Yet these plants are still burned frequently and re-sprout and fruit following fire. We often look to trees as the pinnacle of beauty, longevity, carbon storage, erosion prevention, However, the extension root, extensive root systems on native ground cover also function as soil stabilizers for carbon sequestration and habitat for underground wildlife. So if you look at the graphic, the circled plant on the left up there, that's one of the many pasture grasses we now see across the southeast. Non-native bahia grass, Bermuda grass, and many other pasture and turf grasses are sod forming grasses. That means they have short roots with many rhizomes that spread outward and form a thick thatch-like ground cover. While our native grasses and native plants are primarily what we call bunch grasses, which means they grow upward out of a point and don't spread horizontally in the same way as sod forming grasses. This leaves space between our native plants for bare soil, which is required for their light feathery seeds to germinate. We'll come back to this concept later. But if you, look, if you just look at that picture, you can see how extensive the root systems were on some of these plants. So the plant you see here has a great name. It's wild dog tongue buckwheat. And um, my coworker has reminded me of this multiple times because I've seen it in the field recently um, blooming and I keep forgetting the name. So that is wild dog tongue buckwheat for you guys. Um, notice how large the root is compared to the above ground plant material. This is a classic example of a plant formed in fire maintained or regularly grazed ecosystems. Plant communities such as those in pine savannas take centuries or even more to assemble. Viewing these as old growth grasslands help us better understand these plants needs so that we can focus conservation and management strategies to suit those needs. One common misunderstanding in wildlife habitat management is the effect of disking to stimulate plant growth. This practice has been promoted for game management for many years, and while disking may stimulate quick growing, fast colonizing plants, it can actually remove a significant portion of your native ground cover in the process. So that list there just represents a few of the documented 25% of native species that are lost with the first pass of a plow or harrow. This absence was maintained in this study for at least three years after the disturbance. Of course, there are times when disking can be useful in wildlife habitat management, 
especially in the case of areas that have already experienced significant loss of native ground cover. However, management for high quality wildlife habitat should include a focus on managing for a diverse and robust native ground cover. And where possible, limiting ground disturbance is important to that. All that to say, intact native ground cover is the foundation of wildlife habitat. Here's another quote from an early naturalist, John Muir. In pine barrens most of the day, low level sandy tracks, the pines wide apart, the sunny spaces between full of beautiful abounding grasses, liatris, long wand-like solidago, saw palmettos, etc., covering the ground in garden style. Here I sauntered in delightful freedom, meeting none of the cat-clawed vines or shrubs of the alluvial bottoms. I just love that quote. I think it's a great description of what they were seeing in these areas back then. So moving on to some of the wildlife that depended on pine savanna ecosystems. Um, amphibians and reptiles are some of the most misunderstood and important members of an ecosystem. Amphibians have semi-permeable skin that allows them to absorb oxygen and a layer of mucus that helps keep them moist. They have complex life cycles and they go through various life stages that often look very different from each other. And reptiles, they have scales or scoops that are made of similar material as your fingernails. Both of them use the environment to regulate their temperature and need a combination of humid, shady areas and sunny areas to do so. Both amphibians and reptiles feed a variety of other animals, including birds, mammals, and even other reptile and amphibian species. Some act as predators and help keep rodent populations in check, which can help with the spread of diseases. Reptiles and amphibians are also valuable indicators of environmental health. Amphibians in particular are sensitive to pollution because their permeable skins easily absorb toxins. And because many reptile species are long lived and they can often suffer from disturbances like habitat loss or pollution for extended periods. A diverse community of amphibians and reptiles indicates that an area is healthy and that it can support plant and animal life that they need. So the longleaf pine ecosystem, or one of the pine savanna ecosystems that we're looking at with all of our native ground cover, it's home to approximately 35 amphibians and 38 reptiles. 30% of these species depend almost exclusively on longleaf pine habitat, and as with the range of longleaf pine and native ground cover, many are declining, with 35 listed as threatened or endangered. 35%, excuse me. Amphibians are particularly sensitive to changes in the landscape because many require fish-free herbaceous wetlands to reproduce, and fire maintained uplands to spend the rest of their lives. Many isolated wetlands, also known as ephemeral ponds, hold water only temporarily, which means they periodically dry out. Um, most of those ponds historically experienced fire wind dry, which reduced shrub encroachment and leaf litter buildup, which encouraged grassy herbaceous plants to grow in them. Amphibians also lay what's termed a naked egg mass, which is really prone to being eaten by fish, which is why they need those fish-free wetlands. In Florida, isolated wetlands are used as breeding habitat by at least 28 species of amphibians. Of these, only 14, um, or 14 are obligates, meaning that they breed exclusively in isolated wetlands and nowhere else. Um, and burned herbaceous wetlands provide grassy cover for amphibian eggs in the water. Fire and native ground cover also make travel for these animals really easy because it clears the forest floor of debris. So historically, we had 36 mammal species that used pine savanna. I bet you guys didn't know that bison and elk used to be in the Southeast too. Bison and elk are obligate grassland species, which means they require grasslands to survive. Alongside overhunting, habitat loss ultimately sealed their fate across the Southeast. There are some efforts to manage red wolves on an island in Florida that some of you may be familiar with. Um, if, over in the Panhandle, it's St. Island, or excuse me, St. Vincent Island. Um, it's also near Apalachicola. Y'all probably go over there to have fun. <laughs> um, and there is a small family of red wolves there. They were introduced and they're monitored there as part of a conservation effort, um, but it's likely that they'll probably never be reintroduced to the rest of the state. Uh, if you look to the right, we have a fox squirrel, a pocket gopher, or what some people call a sandy mounder, and a Florida mouse. Fox squirrels are known to inhabit mature, fire-maintained upland pine ecosystems. They build their nests in trees and eat a wide variety of foods that are available in these forests, including nuts, acorns, flowers, pine seeds, insects, and fungi. Pocket gophers are incredible ecosystem engineers. 
They spend most of their life underground, building a tunnel highway and discarding soil excavated from those tunnels above the surface. You've probably seen their mounds of sand on your property or in fields um, where they're kind of relegated to now. Uh, as they move the soil to the surface, they recycle nutrients and potentially viable seeds that may have been buried for decades. If you check out one of their mounds, you're probably going to find bits of charcoal from fire that burned across the land decades or even centuries ago. So they're super cool little critters. Pine savannas also support a diverse bird population. Approximately 100 birds ranging from ground dwelling to canopy dwelling birds depend on habitat provided by native ground cover in a pine savanna. Just because a species is canopy or mid-story doesn't mean that they don't depend on native ground cover to fulfill certain needs. Calcium is very important to birds. Um, shrubs actually lock up a significant amount of calcium, whereas herbaceous ground cover will lock up much less, which means like it just holds onto it. After a fire, which consumes most of the shrubs and encourages grassy herbaceous species, more calcium is available to wildlife. And in research has shown, as time since fire increases, calcium becomes less available. One of our endangered species that depends on pine savanna, the red cockaded woodpecker, has been documented as having higher clutch sizes for a couple of years post fire. If you look at the bottom right, you'll see one of my favorite birds, the bobwhite quail. Some of you may have grown up hearing their calls, but now find silence where they once existed. These birds are declining across their range due to loss and fragmentation of native ground cover habitat. Quail have extremely specific habitat needs for a population to survive long term, and those needs are only met in fire maintained pine savanna. For those who know quail, you probably know everything likes to eat them, including us, <laughs> including me. <laughs> Some of the last strongholds for this bird and many other pine savanna species are actually on hunting plantations that never stop seeing fire used in land management. There are other pineland bird species that are decreasing as well. Pictured here, we have the eastern meadowlark on the left and the red-headed woodpecker on the right. Both, in addition to being very vibrantly colored birds, have important roles in their ecosystem, and they're unfortunately declining due to habitat loss and fragmentation. I'll leave that up for a second so you guys can read the, the names. So what exactly does native ground cover do for these animals? Well, wildlife need food, water, shelter, and space to survive. Those four components make up a habitat and differing amounts and types of each determine habitat quality. So we're gonna examine some of the ways that native ground cover addresses each of these needs. Native ground cover offers food throughout the year. Varying flowering and fruiting times across hundreds of species allow wildlife to take advantage of different plants and fulfill different nutritional needs throughout the year. Pollinators make use of flowering plants, providing food to young turkeys, quail, and other birds. And then when seeds develop, they have access to a different type of food and a lot of other animals join in on the feast. So uh, let's take a look at the menu in a pine savanna. With over 900 species of grasses, forbs, and shrubs, there's a lot to choose from. Notice that each flower pictured on this page is a different size, shape, and color. When we were talking about a little bit about vegetative structure earlier, um, that's where this comes in. Differences in plant structure allow different sized insects and other wildlife to use them. When you look at your yard, do you see a diversity in plant sizes, shapes, species, ages, heights, flowering times? Imagine your yard in, or neighborhood as a restaurant for wildlife and consider how many choices they have on the menu. Diversity is key to fulfilling wildlife's nutritional needs. So in areas where oaks and other hardwoods have shaded out native ground cover, the main food available is acorns two to three months out of the year. So imagine having a single grocery store available to you. In this grocery store, it only has one shelf with three types of bread available for two to three months a year. And that's all the food you have access to the entire year. That's kind of what this picture on the screen is, is like to wildlife. So pine savanna ground cover consists of lots of legumes, more than 100 species, and they're very important. Legumes, of course, are nitrogen fixers, and they're an important source of protein for wildlife. The leaves, fruits, and flowers of these plants are eaten by many herbivores, and the seeds are important for small mammals. Of course, they are also important for birds and insects. Several species grow low to the ground, allowing very small animals access to these food items. That one. So that 
plant. That's our native powder puff mimosa. It, it can make an excellent ground cover for those looking to add some native vegetation to their lawns. Um, and it's quite beneficial to wildlife. And if you'll click again, thank you. That one, that's partridge pea, and it's an excellent food source for quail and turkey. Shrubs, so shrubs provide food and cover for wildlife. The bottom right is one of our native blueberry species. As you can see, shrubs come in various shapes and sizes, offering food at different heights for many species. Um, some of the other shrubs listed here, the middle bottom, that is our native uh, winged sumac. A lot of people see that as a very weedy plant, um, but it's actually quite beneficial to wildlife. Birds will use it. Um, the one in the bottom left is, I believe that's pokeweed. And that's often found in like kind of under trees and pastures. I've, this is where I've seen it a lot. And it's also very beneficial to wildlife, but it's often seen as a weed. Uh, the native, i sorry, I can see the questions. The native blueberry plant at the bottom right, I believe is uh, shiny blueberry, um, but there's a lot of different species of native blueberries in Florida. So, you know, if you're interested in them, you're welcome to reach out to me afterwards. So grasses, grasses are at the center of everything. The seeds and vegetation are important food sources. They offer shelter from predators and they serve as fine fuel needed to promote the frequent fire that maintains the entire ecosystem. Many of these grasses contain flammable oils in them, which encourage fire and help it spread across pine savannas. But the grasses burn quickly and they carry fire across the landscape instead of smoldering and holding heat for long periods of time. Uh, one of the plants here, actually, I think the bottom middle one might be muley grass, which is something that people use in landscaping, and that can be very beneficial for wildlife, and it's also pleasing to the eye. So let's look at some examples of shelter. And you may hear me use the word cover in this presentation, and today I'm kind of referring to the same thing. Uh, we can go to the next one. So well-managed sites with native ground cover offer numerous areas of bare sandy openings. These openings serve as areas where quail, mice, and others can find exposed seeds and insects. The overstory, kind of overstory for these guys, of grasses, forbs, and shrubs give cover from predators as these tasty little morsels move from opening to opening seeking food. Look at that little guy up there. He looks pretty tasty for, for a hawk or something like that. Um, Okay, so if you're a quail, you can easily travel through this grassy corridor and feed on seeds and insects as you go while being mostly hidden from predators. So this is an example of wiregrass burned during the growing season. I took this picture last week and the wiregrass was burned in May of this year. If this were a continuous area of native ground cover, you can kind of see with that path that I so expertly drew there how um, a quail or a mouse or other small animals could weave beneath that plant without being noticed by predators and easily travel over the bare soil. You can also see some little uh, plants here underneath the wire grass, those little leafy plants, and those provide food for wildlife as they're traveling through there as well. Native ground cover provides young tortoises and other small young wildlife, ample cover, keeping them protected from predators during their formative years. So this is another clump of wiregrass I took a picture of last week, burned in May of this year. And in this picture, I'm looking straight down at the plant, which has a burned out center. This grass with a hollow center would be a perfect nesting area for a quail or a mouse or something like that. Good native ground cover habitat includes scattered shrubs and small trees as well. Scattered shrubs and spots of, of, of increased shrubs provide increased shelter for predators and small animals when necessary without impeding their movement like a thicket of shrubs might. Fire is essential in maintaining a scattered shrub component and preventing shrub takeover of native ground cover. Places like the saw palmetto pictured here are often affectionately referred to as quail houses in some places. Okay, finally, let's look at water. I know that's not a picture of water on screen there, so you'll see why in just a second. Quail, mice, tortoises, and all, all of our native wildlife get most of their water needs through preformed water, which is water contained in vegetation, seeds, and insects. A habitat with robust native ground cover fulfills the water needs of all native wildlife, or at least almost all. Our amphibians do need isolated wetlands and that kind of thing to reproduce. 
So if native ground cover is so important, where has it all gone? Much has been lost to fire suppression, soil disturbance, conversion to agricultural crops or development and invasive species. If you look in that bottom right there, that's Kogan grass. And that is one of our worst invasive species. And as you can see, it's taken over that entire pine stand. Um, if you were to walk out there, you wouldn't see another plant besides Kogan grass. Some of those invasive species also alter the way fire moves through an ecosystem, which can change the effects that it has on the vegetation there as well. So this is what much of our pine lands look like today. They were very easy to convert to pretty much anything we wanted because most of them were dry upland grassy ecosystems. So, you know, what better place to, to plant something or build a town in such a beautiful place? So a lot of our pinelands have been converted to pretty much everywhere you stand in, in North Florida. There have been some efforts to provide alternative food sources to wildlife. Uh, however, food plots should not be considered um, the primary resource for wildlife. They should be considered a supplement to well-managed habitat. Careful consideration should be given when considering developing a food plot because the placement of these plots could destroy native ground cover that may still be recoverable. Many old pine savanna sites have been converted to improved pasture. These areas are often a monoculture of non-native grass, like the Bermuda grass and the Bahia grass we discussed earlier, with scattered invasive species like tropical soda apple or kogan grass or smut grass. Recall that one of the most notable features of our native ground cover is that it does not form a thatch or a sod-like cover. This illustration demonstrates the key difference. So sod-forming grasses outcompete native species for space, nutrient, and light resources. They block native seeds from being able to reach bare mineral soil, which prevents them from reproducing. They kind of act similar to invasive species, crowding out and replacing native ground cover over time. And it's very difficult to establish native ground cover in a place that's been converted to an exotic pasture grass. So what can you do? Well, you can plant native ground cover and you can plant pollinator plants in your landscaping. Um, if you have a larger property, you could do uh, sections of it like along roadsides or power lines. Um, if you have planted pines, Thinning your stand early so that it allows sunlight to reach the floor. And if you can get prescribed fire on your property, that will stimulate native ground cover. Um, for pines, again, if you manage on a long rotation, so you are thinning early, but then growing those trees for a very long time instead of uh, growing and cutting them all down at the same time and, and repeating the process of planting and cutting everything. Um, if you manage for a longer rotation, it can help. Uh, if you plant longleaf pine over slash in areas where it's appropriate, slash can be appropriate in wetter sites. Longleaf pine can do anywhere from a slightly wet site to a very dry site. Um, and those will, will favor native uh, ground cover because their pine needles will help carry fire easily and that you can burn them more easily as well than other pine trees. Um, if you plant at lower densities, you're allowing more sunlight to stimulate the ground cover as well. And like I said, use fire where possible, leaving snags or dead trees on your properties. Um, those are fantastic homes for everything from reptiles and mammals to pollinators um, that, will, that will nest in those. If you can create an opening on your property or even use this, like I said, the side of your driveway as an opening and, and maintain some grassy cover there, something that will actually grow up and be tall enough for wildlife to have some cover in, that can be helpful. In cases of using herbicides, um, especially when planting pines or, or planting anything, try to target woody species because those are the ones that are going to take over your pine stand, whereas um, your native grasses and forbs are not going to cause any problems for them. Um, so you want to be selective in using herbicides when you need to use them. And then, of course, learn to identify and control or eradicate invasive plant species uh, anywhere, anywhere that you are. Because even if you just live in town, if you have an invasive species on your property and somehow it's able to go from your property to a, a natural area, then that, that natural area is now affected by something that could completely ruin the native ground cover. So if you have any kogan grass or kudzu or um, some, some of the pretty bad ones on your property, it's really good and helpful for the whole state to manage those. And, Burned herbaceous underscores have also been proven to have significantly higher insect populations than unburned areas. And of course, 
Insects are an invaluable source of protein for young quail and other birds. The last few slides that I have are some uh, examples of ground cover restoration on properties in North Florida. Um, some of these sites just, you know, hadn't had management for a while and uh, the landowners came in, they said they wanted to improve wildlife habitat. So they did. So here's what they did. This is on a flatwood site, which is a, a site that sees some flooding occasionally or some wetting of the soil and uh, would have historically also seen fire. So don't underestimate the potential seed bank on sites that haven't been converted to row crops or improved pasture. Um, if you see there, you know, that's the same property. All they did was mow, cut the vines, treat the vines to make sure they didn't come back and take over again. And then they did one dormant season burn. And there you go. You've got some native ground cover coming back. So here's another one. Uh, in fact, the next two examples are from the same site. So um, for these, it's a pretty drastic difference. If you keep an eye on the two reference trees in both of these photos, it's, it's without those trees, you probably wouldn't believe your eyes. Isn't that just gorgeous? Look at all that, all the ground cover that came back and all the flowering plants that are there now. The treatment and stun to that property included mulching the laurel and water oaks, um, leaving some of the live oaks and turkey oaks and that kind of thing. Um, treating oak re sprouts to keep them from coming back in full force and taking over again. Um, and then three May to June burns. And I believe those were annual, like one after the other. Pretty amazing stuff there. So again, this is on that same site, different area. Um, notice there's a few flowering plants in this area because there's a little bit more sunlight in this area. So there's some kind of scattered out there. Keep an eye on that Y-shaped tree on the right. And there you go. So the, again, the treatment's done to that property. They mulched the laurel and water oaks. They treated the oak re sprouts with herbicide to prevent them from overtaking the area again. And then they burned it three consecutive years. And you get so much coming back in areas that haven't had significant soil disturbance. So, excellent. I'd love to leave that, that up on the screen all every day, but I have to move forward so that we can take questions. <laughs> all right, thank you, Megan. That was excellent. Um, so, and also I'll note that uh, Joseph Vaughn and Lainey Carter, who are Megan's colleagues at FWC have been putting a lot of great uh, links in the chat that it related to what Megan's been talking about. And before we, um, yeah, so we're going to open it up for questions and everyone should definitely put their questions in the chat if they have them and then we'll go through those. And before we start answering questions, Megan, I'm wondering if you just want to talk for a minute or two about the landowner assistance program itself and yes. what it does, because yeah. I I'm sure there's some people on here that aren't familiar with the program and, and the, you know, what you offer as a service. Okay, can you do me a favor and go to the next slide then? Okay, well, you were prepared. <laughs> oh, yes, I was prepared. <laughs> so, okay. Um, so again, my name is Megan Ellis. Um, I am a landowner assistance program wildlife biologist. Um, I am basically uh, when somebody reaches out to me, I become their personal biologist and they can contact me for information on everything from plant ID to uh, asking me how they should improve their property or how they can improve their property for wildlife. Um, and I will help them. <laughs> so, um, so I teach people about their properties, historic ecosystems, how amazing their land is. I, I do give wildlife habitat management recommendations. I do plant and wildlife identification. Um, and really the best way for me to understand you, you, your goals and your property is to set up site visits. And so that's where I come out. I talk to you a bit and that kind of thing. Um, and of course, there's actually landowner assistance program biologists across the state. So um, I'm not sure where everybody's tuning in from today. But uh, there on the screen, you can see there's different regions and each of those regions, those are all, all of my um, lovely supervisors. And you can contact those numbers and basically they will uh, assign one of us to work with you. And we will do our best to help you in whatever situation you are. And there's no land size min uh, minimum or maximum or, you know, we'll work with anybody from, you know, less than one acre all the way up to thousands of acres. And, uh, and we're just here to help. Um, all, like, uh, all of our services are free and we're, you know, we're, we're at your service. It's not something that, um, 
that you have to do. Like we give you recommendations. You're, you're not obligated to do anything. Um, you know, you're, we're happy to talk to you anytime. I hope that gives a, a little bit of a rundown of it. And um, thank you to Lainey and Joe for popping those links in the chat. So we are the, the North Central region, that pink region there. Um, all three of us work, work in that region. So if you ever uh, contact us and you're from one of those pink highlighted counties, then you'll probably get to talk to one of us. Um, if you call one of the other ones, you'll get one of our other lovely biologists. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen unless there's any other slides you have hidden that you want to share. That is all that I have. <laughs> Okay, and then it's up to you if you want to have your camera on or not. Um, oh, yeah, I can turn my camera back on for questions. And <laughs> we will go ahead and we can go through some of these questions that have been shared. I'll try and kind of go in chronological order so that if you asked it early on. So as everyone hopefully heard, and I posted in the chat, the answer to the question was 900. So there's a lot of species out there that you maybe you weren't aware of and let's see we've got one of the first questions that was asked so there's um someone asked about different ground cover for um acidic shaded soils i don't Ooh, know if you have an answer for that that's very specific but it's very specific yes um so in shaded areas for a native ground cover it can be a little bit hard um, there are more shrubs that would be able to tolerate the shade than there are um, like grasses and herbaceous plants, but um, we can certainly help you out with that as far as getting you a specific species list. I don't know what county you're in, um, what area of Florida, so I would want to see that first before I give you recommendations on specific plants. Um, so if you're interested in reaching out to us, uh, my email, well, it was it's not on the screen anymore, but if you can take down the, the number that was there, or I can throw them back on into the chat or something, and you can contact us and we'd be happy to help. And actually on that note, someone else asked about, I don't know what resources are available maybe on the FWC website or elsewhere about um, a list of different plants that people so, could uh, not on our website, but um, there is a fantastic uh, place that you can go, and that is the Florida Native Plant Society website. They actually have this really cool, nifty little tool um, that, Lainey, can you grab that really quick? I'm trying to grab it, but mine's not working. Um, the Florida Native Plant Society has a really nifty tool where you can select your county and uh, select the kind of plants you want, sun, shade, what kind of soils, wet, dry, that kind of thing. And you can then um, you know, click enter search and it'll give you a list of plants that are good for your area. Um, so that's one of my go-tos. I will say as far as um, benefiting wildlife, focus on the, um, the grasses, the flowering plants and the shrubs in that list. We don't really need any more trees planted um, as mo most of our trees are, um, or mo most of our trees are still out there. Um, the most beneficial stuff is going to be the those herbaceous plants for wildlife. Hopefully that's great. Helpful. Yeah, and I think um, someone asked about the effects of roller chopping, and I think you addressed it right after they asked that. Um, that is okay. Okay, <laughs> that's a very good question. Yes. Um, I'm not sure. So this question from Michael. Does the BT in mosquito dunks, if used in fish free ponds, adversely affect native amphibians? I'm thinking about residential native plant scapes. Okay. I'm not really sure about aquatic um, um, chemicals that are used or, or what, I don't even know what that is. I'm sorry. I'm not, I don't either, um, to be honest. Maybe someone I else on apologize. this apologize. It's not my wheelhouse, but, um, but if, if you want to contact us, I can find somebody and get you the information for sure or at least as much information as we have. There's some things that just haven't been studied yet and we're still learning. So, you know, we do the best we can with the information we have at this time. Okay, so this question was, I think they directed it to, they sent it as a direct message, but I think it was meant for everyone. Um, they said they have 90 acres south of I-10 and they cannot burn. So their plan is to mow once a year in the dormant season. Is that a good plan? 
Yeah. So um, I did they. Um, I don't know if you have pines or not, but mowing is an excellent way to uh, promote wildlife habitat. If you can't burn, uh, one of the ways that you can make mowing better is to actually mow in strips and leave some some cover for wildlife. You know, if you just do one pass and then you leave a strip of, of unmowed area and then you mow a, you know, another pass. And then if you do that on a rotation, you get what's called rotational mowing. Um, you can actually, you'll mow a strip this year and skip a strip or skip two strips and then mow another strip um, and then skip two strips. And then the next year you mow the one next to it, you end up with a, with a vegetation height that's, that is staggered. And that's actually much better for wildlife than just doing one uh, straight mowing. The other thing is if you mow at a height of about 12 inches, um, it, it's, it's more beneficial because you're still leaving a little bit of cover for wildlife as well. Um, so it can mean less mowing in the long run if you do something like rotational mowing to manage for wildlife habitat. Okay, great. And I'm going to, we have about a little on just under 10 minutes left to continue answering questions and we will continue to do that. And um, while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and launch a really quick poll. It's just four questions, uh, basically just asking if you learned anything today. So if everyone can fill that out while we're continuing to answer questions, that would be great. So the next question was, I, mean, I don't know, maybe if you have anything else to add, you maybe just address this, an alternative to burning that the majority of homeowners can't, can do. So. Yeah, mowing is definitely a good one. And honestly, in some cases, not mowing. Um, if you have, you know, um, if you're in an area where you have turf grass or pasture grass and it's possible, uh, leaving some vegetated area that's not mowed is going to be beneficial because it might give some time for some species to be able to flower and reproduce. One of my favorite plant species that uh, everyone sees as a, an obnoxious weed is a native plant called um, Biden's or Biden's alba is the scientific name. Um, I actually don't know the common name for that plant, but um, it's a white flower with a yellow center and it grows everywhere. And it, you, if you're walking through the woods, you have these little, um, yes, beggars stick. Thank you guys, y'all are the best. Um, it has these little um, seeds that are quite spiky and they'll stick to you. And that stuff is a fantastic pollinator plant. And if you see it growing in your yard, just let it go because you're going to be benefiting wildlife by leaving that plant there. Thank you. Um, Jen asked if there's a way to protect, or I'd say add if it's necessary to protect wildlife prior to an electric burn. Um, okay, so as far as prescribed fires effect on wildlife, there's a lot that, that we could go into on that for sure. Um, in general, most of our wildlife populations are not significantly affected by a burn. They're more affected by a lack of fire. So um, when we don't burn, you get, uh, over time, you get oak trees growing up and they will uh, grow up very quickly in the absence of fire and they will shade out native ground cover, which eventually becomes like those pictures you saw where there's a bunch of oaks and there's pretty much only leaves on the ground, some vines, and that's all you've got. You've got acorns two to three months out of the year, um, maybe a bit of smilax and not much other food. So um, in the long term, and another thing to think about is that these places had been burning a long time before we stopped fire here. Um, these wildlife had survived under those conditions for quite a long time. So without, uh, without fire, you actually lose a lot more species than you gain and then you protect. So while you may have um, some species that are directly impacted, mainly slower, smaller critters that you can't move as fast, you know, amphibians sometimes, um, and, and maybe some reptiles, you may get some direct impact from fire, but it's not significant enough to, um, to prevent or, or to completely stop using it because the benefits after a fire are so significant that they allow these populations to reproduce and continue living on. Um, in the future. If you're more interested in, in some more information on fire's effect on wildlife, I'd be happy to connect with you and give you some more information on that. We have a lot of research on this now 
And it is a very nuanced topic. You know, there's a lot of information that we've collected on this, but the consensus is that fire ultimately is bettering wildlife habitat and the lack of it is what we, what ends up losing more species than uh, protecting it. Yeah, protecting them. I hope that makes sense. And let's see. So several people have asked a similar question um, about looking more at urban yards, uh, ground mm -hmm. cover in urban yards. And I don't know if you want to address that specifically. Yeah, sure. So I, I saw one question in the chat, you know, like, what do you do for that, you know, have a homeowner or things like that? You get complaints from the city or complaints from your neighbors about not mowing your lawn. You know, this is honestly going to be something systemic that we have to address. This is going to be a change in the mindsets of everyone who works and on a homeowners association boards and, and that kind of thing. It's, it's going to be a process that it, it will take you and people like you who care that uh, bring this up to them and explain the importance of, of urban habitat. Um, because every little bit counts. You can have um, pockets of wildflowers throughout a neighborhood that can be just enough of a matrix to allow a pollinator population to survive um, or birds or things like that. So um, I think over time, if we if, if people care and people bring it up and explain the benefits of, of not mowing or of, of planting plants that may not be quite as aesthetic over time, unless you really love meadows like I do, um, then we might be able to make some change in that. But in the meantime, you know, don't don't break your, your laws of your homeowners associations to help wildlife. Try to plant in um, in designated areas. There's um, a great website for this actually, um, and and more resources. And you're you're welcome to reach out to me. But Florida Friendly Landscaping um, is a fantastic online resource for planting um, your yard with native plants and and Florida friendly species. And of course, I'm happy to to look at where you live and give you a list of plants as well that are pretty plants that you can still plant in a landscaping fashion um, that will benefit native pollinators and wildlife. I hope that helps. And just to add to that or follow up on that, I think that it sounds like from some of the questions that people posed earlier, they might be looking for alternatives to grass as a ground cover in their urban environment. So do you have any recommendations for that? So um, the Florida Friendly Landscaping folks, um, uh, one of their recommendations is perennial peanut, but that is not a native species. Um, my recommendation would be that powder puff mimosa that we showed earlier. But really, uh, there's there's a few different plants. There's powder puff mimosa, uh, frog fruit, which is a cute little small plant and does provide a ground cover. I think the best thing you can do if you're trying to encourage wildlife is to plant a diversity of species. So you're not going to have one beautiful, like same looking lawn if you are trying to convert to native ground cover. But um, there's a, a suggestion in the chat, uh, twin flower. I don't know much about that plant, but but you can do um, the sunshine mimosa um, or, or powder puff mimosa. You can do the frog fruit. And if you plant a mixture of these, you might get a decent ground cover that looks green. And you also have a lot of little flowers that come up that help um, wildlife. So that would be my recommendation. Of course, there are some places that don't allow you to change your turf to a native vegetation, in which case, again, we just need to explain and talk to people and, and, and help you know, educate them on why it's important that we do these kinds of things. Um, there's a lot of good suggestions in the chat for um, for some native ground cover vegetation. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I, I always appreciate when we have a lot of great experts that are also tuning in. So I love that everyone also is helping share some of their knowledge. And we are almost out of time. Um, one question that was asked twice that we didn't answer was people wanted, you mentioned at the very beginning of the presentation what the remaining percent of longleaf pine or total acreage of longleaf pine is. Yes. So um, at the last time, uh, of, I don't know what year it was that this information was collected, but the last time that I know of, uh, we currently set it around 4.7 million acres of, of restored Longley Pine. Um, and that is due to effort. And so we dropped down to like 2.6 million acres. Now we're back up to 4.7. So 
uh, originally from you know 90, 60 to 90 million acres. So we have um, increased, and that has been due to the work of private and public landowners. Or you know, uh, there's a lot of private landowners that have been helpful and and really Im important in that process. And so that's why I'm here. Um, and so in case there's any private landowners out there that are looking to do that kind of work, I can hopefully help you reach that goal and improve wildlife habitat. All right, thank you, Megan. Um, any any final things you wanted to mention that you didn't get a chance to mention? We are at the last minute. I think, I, I, I'm sure there's a lot, honestly, but what I would say is just reach out to us. Uh, we're Like I said, we're happy to help. We have, a, amongst all of us, there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of different backgrounds. And if one of us doesn't know something, I certainly don't know everything. We'll certainly find you somebody that knows it or, you know, or we'll look into what the current research is and see what's going on and see if we can find more information for you. Great, thank you, Megan, that was excellent. And I did put the link in there to the Landowner Assistance Program website. So hopefully that has the information people are looking for as far as contacts on it. And I appreciate everyone being here today. Um, we will be back in October on the 21st with a talk on bats in Florida. And then in November, on the 18th, the topic will be invasive uh, reptiles in Florida. So I'm looking forward to both of those. And I um, appreciate everyone being here. And thank you very much, Megan, for the excellent presentation. Thank you all. Thank you all for coming. Mm -hmm.